Welcome back to our small group study, Fruit of the Spirit, Growing in Godliness. We're now in week number two, and we are looking at the first of the Fruit of the Spirit, recorded in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, just a reminder again, much of what we're doing comes out of the book Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit by Christopher J.H. Wright. You can find the link to this on our website. You can buy it there if you're interested in reading more. It's a really good book. Today, uh, we are starting with love. Love is the very first uh, fruit of the Spirit, or I should say characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. Because remember, the fruit of the Spirit is singular. All nine of these characteristics are characteristic of the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. But first, we have to ask the question, what is love? How do you define it? How do you explain it? Is it an emotion, an attitude, an action? The truth is, we clearly use this word with a wide range of meanings. So in one conversation, you may hear me say, I love pizza, and I love my wife, and I love my dog, and I love football. Right? We can use this word in relation to food, a relationship, a pet, an activity. And these are just a few examples. However, I think it's safe to say that we mean different things with this word. We don't mean that we love pizza the same way that we love our wife, our spouse, hopefully. Therefore, we understand that there are different ways we can use the word love. So, when we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, and we're looking at the first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, we need to know what type of love we're talking about. And this is actually difficult to do in the English, but Paul is at a great advantage because Paul is writing in Greek. And you see, whereas in English we have the one word love, and we use it many different ways, in Greek there are actually four very common words which we translate love. There are four different types of love, if you will. And each one carries with a different connotation, a different meaning, a different context. So to understand what Paul was talking about when he said love is the first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, we have to know what type of love Paul is talking about. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, actually writes an entire book about this. And the title of the book is The Four Loves. In this book, he distinguishes between the four different types of love based on the four different Greek words. So let's just start with a little rundown of, of what love can mean. Okay, So in the Greek, there is the word storge. And storge refers to um, familial love. Okay, C.S. Lewis refers to this type of love as affection. Storge, or familial love, is the type of love that parents feel to their children and siblings feel for each other. It is a natural love. According to C.S. Lewis, affection is the most instinctive. In other words, we instinctively love our family. It just, it just is what it is. We don't have to think about it or, or try we just naturally love our family. That's storge. Right? That's not the word Paul uses here. That's not what Paul's talking about as fruit of the Spirit. Second type of love is the Greek word philia. Philia. Right? Philia is brotherly love. For instance, the city Philadelphia. We get the word Philadelphia from this word philia. Um, this is friendship. All right? This is the love felt between two individuals who are not family, but it's also not romantic. Okay, This type of love usually is the result of a shared interest or a common bond. Again, according to C.S. Lewis, friendship must be about something, even if it were only an enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. In other words, whereas storge, which is that familial love, is natural, it's instinctive, philia occurs as the result of something else. So when guys get together and start talking about football because they love football, that's the type of affection or love that we're talking about. This is that friendship love. Sometimes friendship is formed over a common uh, interest in something. Sometimes friendship is formed just because location. We're in the same place at the same time. Lots of different things can form friendship. So there's a storge, familial love, family love. There's philia, which is friendship. Then there's eros, or eros. Right? We're very familiar with eros. This is where we get the word erotic. 
All right. Eros is romantic love or sexual love. This is the type of love, hopefully, you have between your, your, your spouse, your husband, and your wife. C.S. Lewis writes, by eros, I mean, of course, that state which we call being in love. Or, if you prefer, that kind of love which lovers are in. Okay? Again, this is not the type of love Paul is talking about. He's not talking about familial love. He's not talking about friendship. He's not talking about romantic love. What is he talking about? The Greek word that Paul uses in Galatians chapter 5 is the Greek word agape. Agape. Agape is often translated as charity. Agape is the type of love which God has for us. It is unconditional love. It is never-ending love. It is selfless love. It is sacrificial love. It is this word agape that is used throughout the New Testament to describe both God's love for us, and it's also the word used for how we are supposed to love God and how we are supposed to love other Christians. We are supposed to have agape love, selfless love, sacrificial love. Right? Uh, this love is best defined and demonstrated for us in the life and death of our Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, this is what we read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John 4, 10, the scripture says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So in 1 John 4, 10, the scripture says, This is love, that God sent his Son. God selflessly, sacrificially gave his Son for us. Author Paul David Tripp gives a great definition of love based on this passage. He says that love is willing sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving. Love is willing self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation. This is exactly how God loves us, okay? God loved us while we were still sinners. We couldn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. He just gave us his love. And this is the word Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. The very first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is agape. It is unconditional, selfless love. If we are walking by the Spirit, if we are living by the Spirit, agape is going to be evident in our life. Now, while love for God is the first commandment, right? so the first commandment is that we are to love, or agape, love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In his list of the fruit of the Spirit here in Galatians 5, that's not the, the love Paul is talking about. Paul is not talking about the first great commandment. Paul is talking about the second great commandment. Right? Paul is talking about our love for one another as Christians. Okay. Earlier in Galatians 5, he tells us this. In Galatians 5, verses 13 and 14. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. Paul says this, For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says the entire law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, This is the love that Paul is talking about. But how is that possible? How does loving one another fulfill the whole law? Well, first we have to recognize that Paul is not saying that love of neighbor surpasses love of God. Okay, That's not what Paul is saying. Anyway, loving God is the great commandment. Loving God is the first commandment. However, loving one another, listen, is proof that we love God. We'll talk more about that later. But loving one another is actually proof that we love God. New Testament scholar Timothy George writes, Why did Paul call selfless love of neighbor the fulfilling of the whole law? Not because it is superior to the worship and adoration of God, but rather because it is the proof of of it. You see, if we love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we are going to love our neighbor as ourself. We are going to have that selfless love for one another. Furthermore, our ability to love one another with this type of love, this agape love, literally sums up the whole New Testament law. You see, while there in the Old Testament you have the ceremonial law, uh, you know, the sacrifices and whatnot. You have the civil law, the law that applied just to the nation of Israel. None of those apply anymore to us. However, the Old Testament moral law 
absolutely still applies. You know, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. All of those things still apply. However, the entire moral law of the Old Testament would be fulfilled if we simply loved our neighbor as ourselves. If we simply loved each other with this selfless, self-sacrificial love, then we wouldn't have to worry about the rest of the Old Testament laws because we'd be obeying them. All those moral laws we'd be obeying if we just loved one another. Douglas Moo writes, The whole law aims at doing good to others. And if love if one excuse me, and if one loves truly and consistently, all that the law is aiming at is also accomplished. That's what Paul means when he says that loving one another fulfills the whole law. What he means is if we would just love each other, everything else the law said we'd be doing anyway. However, it's important to remember we're only capable of this type of love when we start with the first commandment. You see, there's a reason Jesus put those commandments in order. Loving God is first and foremost the most important thing, but it's also necessary to achieve the second great commandment, which is loving our neighbor as ourselves. We cannot love each other with selfless, self-sacrificial love if we don't first love God. It is in loving God with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength that we learn to love others as ourselves. So now that we know what type of love Paul's talking about, he's talking about this agape love, let's talk about its importance. Why is this so important? You see, Paul begins the list of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit with this word, agape, or love. Paul is basically establishing its priority over every other characteristic. By listing this characteristic first, Paul is placing it in a position of prominence. Paul is saying, of all of them, this is the most important. And that really shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, Paul's emphasis on love shouldn't surprise us because Jesus has already told us what that the greatest commandments are to do what? Love God and love others. So Jesus has already told us love is, is the, the most important thing. And so, of course, Paul follows suit by telling us the most important characteristic is love. He also tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he says, For now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but he says this, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest is love. Why is that? Why is love so important? Why is it the most important fruit of the Spirit? Timothy George, again, New Testament scholar, writes, Paul might well have placed a period after love and moved on into the conclusion of his letter. For love is not merely first among equals in this listing, but rather the source and fountain from which all other graces flow. In other words, everything starts with love. When we get into the rest of the uh, the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, peace, joy, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control, all of those things start with love. Another New Testament writer, Douglas Moo, writes this, The headline placement of love in the list of the Spirit's fruit is due both to the centrality of love within the New Covenant and because it is the most important bulwark against the factional infighting that seems to be racking the Galatian churches. Now keep in mind, remember, Paul writes to the churches in Galatia because there's this fighting going on, because these other missionaries have come in, and they're preaching a false gospel. They're stirring up trouble. They're telling folks that, oh yeah, Jesus isn't enough. You also have to obey all these laws. And Paul says, no. All you have to do is love one another. Love Jesus, accept him, and if you do that, you will love others. And then don't worry about those other laws. Just love one another. That's why it's so important. Paul is not the only one in the New Testament who talks about the supreme importance of love. Again, when we look back at the New Testament, it's clear that love is the most important. The Apostle John also writes a great deal on this topic. Author J.H. Wright, who authored this book that we're studying, he wrote this, When Christians love one another, says John, it is evidence of some very important realities. Love is the evidence of life, evidence of faith, evidence of God, and evidence for Jesus. 
Wright points out that love is evidence for four things. And he gets all these things from the Apostle John. So let's look at those things. According to John, love is evidence of life, evidence of faith, evidence of God, and evidence of Jesus. So let's start with the first one. Love is evidence of life. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. You see that? He says, we know that we have pa passed out of death and into life. Why? Because we love the brothers. Now, how is that love evidence for life? And what kind of life is Paul talking about? Excuse me, John. What kind of life is John talking about? Well, we know John's not talking about physical life. We don't need proof of physical life. If you're breathing, you have physical life. However, Paul here is talking about spiritual life. He says, if you want to know that you have spiritual life, if you want evidence that you have spiritual life, if you have eternal life, the evidence is your love. Your love for others is evidence that you have eternal life. One of John's primary concerns in writing is the assurance of salvation. You see, John wants Christians to know that they're saved. John wants Christians to know that they have eternal life. Sadly, too many times I ask people today, you know, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? And they say something like, well, I hope so, or I would like to think so. Listen to me. We don't have to hope that we have eternal life. That's not what the Bible teaches us. We can know that we have eternal life. We can know that we're going to heaven. And John says the evidence of it is our love. Now, if we don't have love for one another, if we don't love our brothers and sisters in Christ, well, then you may need to question your salvation. But if you love one another selflessly, sacrificially, then that's evidence that you have eternal life. Secondly, according to John, our love for one another is evidence of our faith. Now, this is obviously very closely related to what we just talked about, okay? Because eternal life is only yours if you have faith in Jesus. However, the purpose here is to make sure we understand the connection between love and faith. Listen, biblically speaking, love and faith are inseparable. Love and faith are inseparable. Again, going back to John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. John writes, and this is his commandment, that we believe faith, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. This is his commandment. Commandment being singular. Notice that. God's commandment, singular. Believe in Jesus and love one another. You see, God has commanded us to do both of these things. God has commanded us to believe in Jesus Christ and he has commanded us to love one another. To do one is to do the other. They're inseparable. You cannot truly believe in Jesus and not love one another. Because if you truly believe in Jesus, you're going to follow Jesus, and Jesus tells us to love one another. We cannot claim to have faith if we refuse to practically love our fellow Christians. So our love for one another is evidence that we have secured eternal life. We talked about that. Why? Because it is evidence that we have placed our faith in Jesus. And that's where salvation comes from. So when we love each other, that is evidence that we have placed our faith in Jesus. Therefore, it is evidence that we have eternal life. Thirdly, John tells us that our love for one another is evidence of God. Now, how is that? How is loving one another evidence of God? Well, let's go back and look what John says. John chapter, again, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is of God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. John literally tells us that God is love. God is the source of all love. We are only capable of loving because God created us and loves us. You know, love is a universal virtue. Every society, every civilization throughout time has valued love. Why? Because we're all created by the same God. 
We were all created by a God who is love, and therefore we value love because we love God, or because God loves us. Since God created us, we all value love. It's part of who we are. When we love one another, we are giving proof or we are giving evidence that God exists. Finally, according to John, our love for one another is evidence for Jesus. Our love for one another is evidence for Jesus. Going back to the Gospel of John, John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Again, Christopher J.H. Wright comments, When Christians love each other, it shows who they belong to. It points people to Jesus. Christians' love is incrementally, excuse me, incredibly. Christians' love is incredibly transforming, and in many contexts, so surprising and countercultural that it can only be the work of Christ, the power of the gospel, the fruit of the Spirit. Here's what Wright says. When we love people like Jesus loves people, it is so shocking that non-believers can't help but take notice. And it actually makes them believe in Jesus. It encourages them, I should say, to believe in Jesus. When they see us loving like Jesus, it's proof that Jesus is real. And that's what we want to do. We want to convince people that Jesus is real by our love. One final point that must be made about agape before we finish up today, and that's this. Agape is practical. Why do you think that is? Why is agape, why is this selfless, self-sacrificial love practical? Okay. If you're with us this spring, or if you're watching online, you can go back on our website and look at a series we taught in the spring of 2017, I Love My Church. We did a whole series on I Love My Church. And we talked about the fact that love serves. It is what love does. Love by nature wants to serve. We talked about the fact that love gives. It is what love does. By its nature, love gives. That is what agape does. Why? Because it's selfless. It's sacrificial. That is what it is. That may not be correct grammar, but you understand. Right? Love is self-sacrificial. Agape is self-sacrificial. It's selfless. It is giving. It is serving. So if we say we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're not serving them, we're not giving, we're not helping them, we're not practically showing that love, that's not agape. That's not the love that is the fruit of the Spirit. When we walk by the Spirit, when we live by the Spirit, that agape love, that selfless, self-sacrificial self love is going to be evident, and everybody's going to see it. All righty, next week, joy. That's going to be a fun one. I'm excited about joy. Next week, we're going to talk about joy as a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to do some studying before next week, go back and read Galatians 5, 22 through 26. That is the fruit of the Spirit passage. I'm going to ask you to read it every single week. Galatians 5, 22 through 26. Read it. Pray over it. Meditate on it. Philippians 4, 1. Philippians 4, 1. Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through 21. Luke 8, 19 through 21. Deuteronomy 16, 11. Finally, John 14, 1 through 3. And Romans 8, 18 through 23. Now, as you read those passages, here's some questions. What images, what people, what places, what activities, what events do you associate with joy? When you think of joy, what pictures, what images, what events, what people come to mind? What is the source of of our joy. What is the source of our joy? What connection does joy have with love? Sorry, I got, I got lost there. What connection does joy have with love? We just talked about love. How are joy and love connected? As Christians, what reasons do we have for joy? Why should we be joyful? And finally, is there a difference between joy and happiness? Joy is a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. Happiness is not. Is there a difference between the two? So, some things to think about before our next lesson. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We love you because you first loved us. 
And you demonstrate that love by sending your son Jesus Christ and showing us what love is. Love is selfless. Love is self-sacrificial. Lord, we thank you for your love. We accept the love of your son Jesus. We ask him to be our savior. We ask you to forgive us our sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask you to give us the strength to love. Lord, help us to grow and to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Let us love our brothers and sisters in Christ in a very real, practical, tangible way. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much, and we will see you guys next week as we talk about joy.